Hello and welcome to Comic Book Herald's Crack and Krakoa. This is the series where I explore the ongoing X-Men series here written by Jonathan Hickman with various collaborators on this special edition of Crack and Krakoa number 13. I'm going to talk about Phoenix, the cosmic entity, the Phoenix Force, in House of X, Powers of Ten, and now the Dawn of X. We're going to answer the questions, what does Jean Grey's costume tell us? I have to say, much ado has been made, perhaps about nothing, over Jean Grey wearing her original 60s Marvel Girl costume in the pages of House of X and now into Dawn of X. While I don't normally give a hoot about costumes beyond very surface-level aesthetic enjoyment, the question of why she's in this costume has gotten enough attention, and I've heard from enough readers, listeners, uh, viewers like you, that it feels worth investigating deeper. So today I'll answer, why is Jean Grey wearing her Marvel Girl costume? What is Jonathan Hickman referring to with the most famous time she put on the Marvel Girl costume? What does this mean for the presence of Phoenix in the Dawn of X-Men comics to come? Some theories and some postulating, as I tend to do towards the end of the video, about some ways we might see Phoenix in the Dawn of X. Before I get into that, thank you everybody for listening. If you like the show, if you like Comic Book Herald, if you like Best Comics Ever, the podcast, please consider liking and subscribing for the podcast. Uh, ratings and reviews are super helpful to help me find more people for YouTube, liking, subscribing, and just checking out the content and commenting with some thoughts of your own is all extremely helpful to helping Comic Book Herald grow. And of course, as always, if you can share with a friend, that's super appreciated as well. Without further ado, then. Let's get into the questions around Jean Grey's costume. <laughs> not something I thought I'd be spending a lot of time talking about. I have to say, I'm not a big costume guy. It doesn't usually, you know, influence me one way or the other in terms of my enjoyment of the story. But what we've had here in the pages of House of X and Powers of Ten is really, since early teasers and preview art, House of X signified some degree of change through costume, right? The very first teaser images that we saw, and I'm going to pull up some examples here, had, you know, some costumes that we haven't necessarily seen for a decent chunk of time. Let's point out some examples here, right? This is like one of the very earliest teaser issues I've got up on the YouTube screen of Professor X, Magneto, Jean Grey, and Cyclops. And I'll be honest, my first thought seeing these images at C2E2 during the announcement of Hickman's return was that the books would be playing heavily with time travel. It looked like characters plucked out of various points in their Marvel history timelines rather than their current incarnations. After all, last we saw Jean Grey in the excellent X-Men Red, she was rocking a more familiar take on the 90s X-Men costumes. It's not surprising then that this change led to questions about why Jean would be wearing, you know, this green go-go skirt and, again, that very 60s-style mask and gloves when other characters, like Cyclops, looks like a fairly modern version. You know, Wolverine looks like a fairly modern rendition of his costume. And, we, you know, we see Jean even now on the pages of X-Force. She's going to be a major player. That hasn't yet come out at the time of recording. But, you know, she looks almost antiquated by comparison to all the other characters who seem to have moved on to different looks. One of the questions that came out of this was in the excellent adventures in poor taste interview conducted with Jonathan Hickman prior to X-Men number one hitting stands, which is that's where I'm at in terms of uh, release dates at time of this recording. X-Men number one has come out. That's as far as we've gotten into Dawn of X. But there's a question here about Marvel girl's gone back to her old sixties costume. It's probably the most controversial wardrobe change in a while. Basically, can you talk about why she's wearing it again? And Hickman here says in in an amazing, amazing answer, I'm not going to lie, this one has been disappointing. I was pretty sure everyone would figure this out as soon as House of X number one hit the stands, and while I'm not going to spoil the story for you, I will say go back and look at the most famous time she put this costume back on. That should help. So, a couple initial thoughts here. First off, this entire interview is incredible. Hickman has absolutely mastered the comically condescending zinger. Uh, Little Tops Hickman telling X-Men fans that he's not mad, just disappointed. As to the most famous time, Jean returned to her Marvel Girl costume. I have to admit, my first thought was X-Factor. Nope, not that. Before remembering the iconic Dark Phoenix saga cover with Scott and Jean fighting for their lives in Uncanny X-Men number 137, written by Chris Claremont with art by John Byrne. I don't have it in front of me, but I'm going to assume lettering by Tom Orzakowski, the legend. And, you know, we have them fighting for their lives against the Shi'ar Imperial, Dar uh, Shi'ar Imperial Guard in the Dark's Phoenix Saga. This is almost certainly what Hickman is referring to and actually opens up some compelling theories for the purpose behind this costume change. Again, like I was saying, I don't usually have a ton 
to say about what characters are wearing beyond just like, yeah, I think Magneto looks cool in all white. Uh, but in this case, I think it actually means something, and it means something about the Phoenix, which we're going to talk about now, why that matters. In the Dark Phoenix Saga, Jean makes a point of requesting her Marvel Girl costume, and when Scott asks her why, she offers a somewhat muddled reply, kind of, you know, falls back onto, well, maybe it's nostalgia, maybe it's feeling a little more comfortable. My interpretation, though, is that after the events of Dark Phoenix, Jean is possessed by a cosmic entity and destroys an entire galactic civilization, among other, you know, hellfire shenanigans, and she's looking for a return to a less traumatic time, a reminder of who she was before the influence of the Phoenix in what we quickly come to learn are some of her final moments. So what does this tell us about the choice to return to Marvel Girl for House of X? The clearest takeaway is that this is Jean Grey without influence or powers of the Phoenix. In the list of Omega Level Mutants, Jean is notably listed as Marvel Girl, not Phoenix, and is specifically designated Omega Level exclusively for telepathy, not telekinetic abilities, right? So this is Jean Grey, Marvel Girl. It's not Jean Grey, Phoenix. Mix in mutant kinds, new resurrection protocols, and toss in the wrinkle that this gene could be a backup of herself before the phoenix ever inhabited her body. I don't necessarily expect this to be the case, but it is possible. More likely is that reincarnating gene through this method does not transfer the cosmic entity known as the phoenix. How could it? So I theorize here that gene has memories of her time as phoenix, assuming she and Charles Xavier have allowed that. But it as is, is you know she is as free from the entity's influence as she has ever been. To me, this gives... The very brief welcome from Professor to Jean more weight in the pages of, I believe it's House of X number one, when Xavier tells her she's safe here. Welcome home. And this means more for Jean, who has had to wear the weight of Phoenix's power and resurrection for years. Or at least that's my initial potential interpretation of what this costume could mean. Okay, with all of that in mind, the more interesting question to me is what does this mean for the Phoenix in Dawn of X? With two exceptions, there's a distinct absence of Phoenix so far in Hickman's X-Men. It's honestly odd, perhaps pointedly so, that there are zero references to Phoenix in any of Myra's lifelines. So throughout some of the Myra McTaggart reveals, you know, we get this thing that she has 10 lifelines. None of the bullets, none of the annotations on her lifelines refer to to Phoenix events. Throughout all the teased events, a Magneto vs. Avengers War, a second Annihilation Wave, an Apocalypse Takeover, tons of interesting stuff, Phoenix simply doesn't come up. The two times we see allusions to Phoenix in House of X and Powers of Ten, the 12-issue incredible setup, are as follows. There's a panel including the Phoenix Five from Avengers vs. X-Men and House of X number two. Phoenix Five, for those of you who don't know, are during the Avengers vs. X-Men event in 2012, Cyclops, Emma Frost, Magic, Ileana Rasputin, Namor, and Colossus all were imbued with a fifth of the powers of the Phoenix, at least initially. Okay, So that is a thing that we saw come up actually in a, a previous lifeline of Myra's in House of X number 2, and there's also been a reference to Phoenix as one of two cosmic entities alongside Galactus that threaten or sort of um, present problems for the likes of of the phalanx, which we see in the year 3000 timelines. The implications as I see them. The phoenix force is going to matter in the grand scheme of this story. That's no secret. It's not going to take, but you know, despite the fact that it's going to matter, it's not going to take the shape or form that we saw Claremont Cockrum Byrne do it, or that we later saw Grant Morrison and company remix in New X-Men, which, you know, is not the, obviously the only time that Phoenix has come back, but given Hickman's sort of reverence for New X-Men, we've seen it referenced and heavily sort of, you know, that is beyond his own Marvel Universe works, referencing Grant Morrison's work in New X-Men is a clear touch point, as I, I think I've made clear throughout a number of these conversations. So we've seen it, we've seen it, you know, influence Gene, and it, it sort of has the potential to go Dark Phoenix on us, where it's the Phoenix Force, this cosmic entity, becomes too much for Gene to wield. Again, Morrison sort of remixes that in the pages of New X-Men. I don't think we're going to see anything like that again. You know, I think the fact that Gene is back in her Marvel Girl costume is, is a pointed way of telling us not only is she free from the influence of the Phoenix, but guess what? We've done that story. We've done those stories several times. We're not going to do them again. I think Hickman is a writer and a storyteller who doesn't like to tread on too familiar territory. And I think that's a very good thing. A more likely scenario for me 
would be something akin to what Hickman did with the Phoenix Force in Secret Wars. So here we have, in the pages of 2015 Secret Wars and the buildup, Cyclops, actually, is sort of prepping for these multiversal incursions. You know, it's kind of the end of the world, end of the multiverses scenario in Secret Wars. And Cyclops, he has a phoenix egg ready to hatch. He finds it, he hatches it, and then, in the pages of Secret Wars, Cyclops actually becomes the phoenix. And he gets very philosophical and powerful until, ultimately, spoilers for 2015 Secret Wars here, he is undone. And I won't, I won't go beyond that so as to not spoil too much because everyone should read my favorite Marvel event of all time, 2015 Secret Wars. That said, Hickman has shown he likes to return to ideas that he brought to the table and maybe didn't tap into as much as he wanted to or had time to in his previous Marvel work. I think the Phoenix Egg is one that very easily could come back. And again, that is pulling from a Morrison idea from back in New X-Men. I think it's actually the the Here Comes Tomorrow arc. So I think something like that is likely. We also have several would-be phoenixes flying around. You know, Jean Grey is not the only host or, or mutant or X-Men who has been the phoenix before. We've seen Rachel Summers, obviously, has a long history as the potential phoenix. We've seen Emma Frost imbued with phoenix. We've seen Cyclops, as I mentioned. And we've also seen, very recently, Wolverine. In the pages of Jason Aaron's Thor run, the future timeline, the most recent run by Aaron and Mike Del Mundo, we've seen Wolverine come in as the Phoenix uh, several times with Old Man Thor. So I don't know necessarily that this is like a timeline uh, Hickman would feel beholden to. I expect he wouldn't. You know, I think there's, in my head, there's a Hickman verse and there's an Aaron verse, and they don't need to merge the two together necessarily. You know, <laughs> I just, I don't think they have to, but it's an option out there. Of, of, you know, a character who has some potential to be a player with, with events related to the Phoenix. We also know Inferno is heavily teased, right? We've seen it in Sinister Secrets, and what that means, most likely, is that Mr. Sinister has a big role to play because he's a major player in the Inferno event Marvel did, uh, a big X-Men crossover in 1989, and also Jean Grey's clone that Sinister created, Madeline Pryor. If Madeline Pryor has a role to play, could she be a potential host or potential, um, you know, part of a Phoenix saga? I think that would be very interesting as well. Finally, I think the biggest Phoenix reveal, reveal, pardon me, is going to come in the form of Krakoa's cosmic defense system. I think one thing we really haven't seen much of to date in X-Men, and it's super early, like I said, Dawn of X number one or excuse me, X-Men number one is the first issue and only issue we've seen in X-Men, but we haven't seen much about cosmic threats. So much of House of X and Powers of Ten is focused on mutants' relationship with man, but specifically humans of Earth. There have been some references to, to Professor X wielding Shi'ar technology. Obviously, in X-Men number one, we see uh, Corsair and the Starjammers present uh, in Cyclops' home in, you know, summer, what is it, House Summers on the moon, right? So, we see spacefaring things coming into play as, as you know, belong in X-Men because they've been a part of the lore. But what about cosmic threats? Okay, Krakoa is insulated and protected from man and sentinels, potentially. Are they protected from cosmic threats? I think we're going to get a big reveal that Professor X and company know exactly where Phoenix is and how to handle the Force, or at least they think they do. I could see Professor X, Magneto, maybe Myra in on it, probably Myra in on it, um, I like to think, with the Phoenix egg in storage on Krakoa, thinking, you know, when Professor X tells Jean, you're safe here, it's a, it's a kindly father figure statement, but it's also possibly with secret knowledge, hey, I know you're safe here because we've got the Phoenix egg in lockdown on Krakoa as we speak. As tends to happen with ideas like that, I could easily see it going south, of course, the, the, the Phoenix cosmic entity. Because, you know, my, th my thought here is if they don't have it, on lockdown, if they don't have some sort of cosmic defense system reveal, what is to prevent Krakoa from being consumed by Galactus or from the Phoenix Force coming and just finding Gene, right? Like there has to be something more to it in the ways that they're insulated from man. They have to be insulated against cosmic threats. I know we saw in Amira Lifeline the reference to they stopped an annihilation wave. Obviously, this is a very capable mutant crew, but I'd be curious to see 
how this is going to build. Obviously, I think the story is going to get more cosmic. We've had all these teases in Powers of Ten, especially for the 1,000-year timeline with the phalanx and with uh, the black hole navig navigatory system that's out there. That stuff didn't get planted to get thrown away. The Phoenix is going to be relevant in telling those stories. The question is how and I think, again, I think we're going to get some teases here in the near future that it's going to be sort of a part of Krakoa's defense system against cosmic threats. So all of that came from a costume change and a, a good question about it. I, again, normally would not spend that much time investigating, but I do think it's interesting because it tells us Jean Grey may have a different role to play in this type of story. I, I would tend to prefer a story that isn't about the Phoenix yet again possessing gene you know it's like we've had dark phoenix saga it's great it's good i don't need to see her overwhelmed with phoenix powers again her wielding the phoenix i think is cool i think it's it's nice when she can kind of wield those powers to her own benefit but that said again we've seen that too so i'm here for new stories i'm here for better stories moving forward and i think we're going to get a lot of them in dawn of x so thanks everybody for listening as always, again, like and subscribe to the content on YouTube. Please subscribe to Best Comics Ever, the podcast, for more of these conversations. And you can go on over to comicbookherald.com, where I will be sharing in the show notes a link to the House of X and Powers of Ten and Dawn of X reading orders. I've got this link here to the Marvel's Best Phoenix comics of all time that I put together not too long ago. So I'll be linking to those. You can always check out guides for really everything comics-related on Comic Book Herald. Com. I think coming up next in Kraken Krakoa, I'm going to be investigating Mike Carey's X-Men run a lot more thoroughly. That was teased as something that Hickman was inspired by and impressed by in the early House of X and Powers of Ten hype. We've now seen some of those details come to fruition in X-Men number one. So that's likely next up for me on the Kraken Krakoa series. Uh, subscribe, stay tuned, and we'll have more of that. Leave a comment if you're following along on YouTube. I want to hear your thoughts as well about what you think is coming in these X-Men comics that have been super exciting. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and as always, enjoy the comics.